For many people, the mere thought of public speaking, those two words send shivers down their spine um, because they don't feel that they are able to do that. And a lot of that misconception is the fact they think, well, public speaking means I'm standing on a stage in front of a thousand people. But for many of us, we speak every single day. We communicate to our teams, we communicate to our families. So what if I could make you a better communicator? Well, today we have author John Bowe. He is the best-selling author of the newest book, I Have Something to Say, uh, and he's uncovering strategies that he's connected from the ancient Greeks and connected it to our way of speaking today. And he's trained thousands of people from grade schools to top CEOs, and he's going to share his tips today. So let's dive into today's episode of You're in Charge, Conversations that Spark Change with author John Bowe. All right, John, so let's dive right into this. I am so curious to understand more about your philosophy of one, how to learn about public speaking and why it's so important and more importantly, how it, how it affects you in so many different ways. What, so let's just start right at the basics. Why are so many people afraid to speak in public? I think I could answer a couple of ways, but I think, first of all, there's, there's very little else that we do that is as important as speaking. I mean, imagine if you were paralyzed and you couldn't move. Mm -hmm. Well, not being able to express yourself well or freely or accurately is kind of like the mental, verbal, emotional equivalent of that. So people are afraid of it because they've never been taught how to do it. So they're bad at it. And it kind of hurts and feels awful every time that you do it badly. Well, let me ask you about that. Do you think it's a misunderstanding of when someone says public speaking, right? We all speak every single day. I think I was reading in, I just happened to have your book here, which I highly recommend. Um, but the thousands of words that we speak every single day just to move through the world. But for some reason, people don't consider that public speaking. The public speaking is, well, I'm on a stage in front of an audience and but we're communicating at our workplace. We're communicating with our families. What's that distinction or what's that skill set that you have found or have dug into to say there is it? Maybe there is a difference, or maybe really there isn't a difference between how we communicate. We're constantly, we're not overthinking talking uh, during the day. So wh where is that disconnect in that in in that way? Well, this is a great question because you know for my book I had to define public speaking early on. Mm -hmm. And in the end, I settled for kind of the most boring definition just to be simple and get it out of the way. So for the sake of simplicity and a working definition, public speaking is anytime you have prepared remarks that you have to express to a person or a group of people. Okay. So that prepared aspect distinguishes it from chatting every day mm -hmm. in an informal way where you don't need to prepare and you don't need to hit a bunch of marks. But if you really want to be accurate and really just grab a hold of the entire concept, I would say it's almost anytime you're talking. Because if you think about inside your head, you're forming mm -hmm. your thoughts, and that's in the privacy of your own head. The moment you put something out into the world, whether it's in person or in your family or at work, it becomes public. Right. I think that's kind of a cooler, handier definition in a lot of ways. So, so I read a quote where someone said, when the words are in your head, you control them. But once they're out, they control you. They represent you. People judge you on your words. But let's, let's unpack that because I think that is one of the, the, the problems for people, even in business, moving up as a leader in a company, you get to the point of saying, well, no, public speaking is in front of a huge audience. But to your point is, well, if I'm doing a preparation, be it a sales presentation to a client, I'm presenting a report to, you know, my supervisors, that's still public speaking because you have to formulate it. Is it, do you think one of the, 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 the downfalls is there's this idea of they're judging me the whole time versus I'm just communicating an idea. I know when I I speak publicly and when people always say, well, I couldn't do that or uh, all I'm worried about is if they're going to like me. And I said, but do you walk through the li your life constantly thinking everything that comes out of my mouth, I hope they like me. And, it, you know, I, I don't know. But so so let's talk about maybe bucketing these 
and then I want to get into your theory of this combination of what you've discovered, you know, with the, uh, the history of, of, of speaking. But if you'd bucket that, if someone isn't saying, I don't want to be a public speaker in front of an audience, but then I do have to prepare comments. I do have to communicate to my supervisors. I do have to communicate to my team in a, in a thoughtful way. So, so what are some things that, and, and maybe this ties into to, to the, the, the core of your book, how can we learn to do it better? Okay, let me back up a little bit and answer a couple of earlier things that you brought up. I mean, it's not just, you know, as you said, it's not just when you're on a stage giving mm -hmm. a kind of classic speech. Anytime you're on a conference call, on a sales call, in a meeting at work where people, you might even say, well, we're just spitballing it informally. Right. It's informal. You still don't want to say anything stupid or racist or, you know, I think hundreds of stupid things a day that wouldn't be fit for public consumption right. on my way to coming <laughs> up with something that I hope, God forbid, is actually worthwhile and worth someone's time to listen. So if all of those things just came out of my mouth as I thought them mm -hmm. and had no ability to edit myself or formulate my thoughts in an intelligible way, it would be a disaster not just for me, but for everyone around me. And I think that's true for everyone at meetings. You people spend what, between 20 to 50% of their time, of their time, at, you know, in meetings. Mm -hmm. Of right. course, with the pandemic, when everything was a Zoom call, that's very much a form of public speaking. And, and so, you know, everybody rolls their eyes about meetings and people hate meetings. And that's partly because they're so boring. And part of the reason they're so boring is because people don't, I don't want to say have the discipline to speak well, but they're not trained to speak well. So, 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 so in that session, so let's focus on the meetings because that's probably relevant to a lot of people going, you've connected with them. They said, oh, I've sat in some horrible meetings or I'm in charge of a meeting. And so if you're, if you're saying they weren't trained to be thoughtful, are there some tips or strategies that someone could follow to be a better speaker or run a better meeting through better speaking? Oh God, you, we could talk, we could have our whole show be about that. Right. Sure. I mean, I think the more common tips you hear about bad meetings are, you know, don't eat during the meeting, don't come late, don't come unprepared, don't slouch, don't look at your phone. So excluding those kind of more obvious ones, there's just on the level of talking, you see it, for example, here's, here's one main vein of sin of meeting sin is you say something and you're not a great public speaker and you kind of halfway mumble it as you're saying it because you're thinking as you're talking right and then i hijack what you said i polish it off i act like i thought of that and i say the same thing over again acting a little bit like i'm smart and you're not that smart and i score points off you or i criticize right. other parts of the team or if it's a meeting that has several teams, I'm bragging about my team, even though that's not the point of the meeting. So if you, you know, speech training for me isn't, we'll get to this later, but it's not just about being confident and mm -hmm. standing in the right way and making eye contact. It's also thinking about speech and thinking about what you're saying and thinking about how it can be more helpful to people. So part of that would be don't repeat what other people said. Don't try to score points. Think, right? you've heard this a million times, but if for anyone who hasn't heard it, why am I talking? Does it need to be said now? Does it need to be said by me? So instead of just blabbering or straying around, you know, what is relevant, uh, there's just asking yourself that question every time. Do I really need to say this now? What is my goal in saying this? And that's one of the key things for learning how to give any speech is just, defining very specifically why you're saying something before you say it no and i i like that i've i've when i've people have asked me i always share a tip that i was given and said as soon as you're on the stage or in front of a group of people it's no longer about you it's about them so what are you trying to do what are you either educating them on what are you sharing with them? What are you teaching them? What are you responding to? It's all about them. And that gets you out of your head to be able to communicate. But I really like your point about, do I need to say it now? I've found myself in meetings. For instance, you just said something. I have my answer. But then the conversation has moved beyond mm -hmm. this. But I still want to say that because I think it's smart. But it's not it's no longer relevant at that moment, but yet 
some people will do it because they do want to, but look at how smart I was in this at, oh. at this one time. And if you look at any, if you look at any meeting from the vantage point of a boss or a manager, I'm sure some of them are fooled by people who are showing off and having smart points that they're making. But by right. and large, if they're looking at who is helpful at problem solving, right, then you lose points for that, even though you came off like the shiny penny for a minute. Right, right, right. I think that's that's really important. And, and it goes back to, I had another boss who used to always say, well, what's point B? Like, okay, what's point B in this conversation? What are we trying to accomplish? And, and more importantly, did we accomplish what we want, we set out to do? And sometimes communications get hijacked or you go down a rabbit hole in another discussion and you look up and the meeting's over and we say, well, we didn't accomplish anything we want. And that also is a gift to your point of meetings to be able to corral the meeting or politely get the meeting on track because you understand how to communicate to people to not offend, to say, we need to stop this, but you control that conversation. Um, so let's dive into the book. I'm, I'm curious what you know, in researching uh, you and looking at some of the other work that you've done, you've written other books, you, you, you contribute a lot, uh, but why this? How did this topic come up for you um, to say, hey, I, I think we have, a, 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 there's a book in here or it's important to me? Okay, I am very much not a business guy or a self-help guy or mm -hmm. a speech expert. So my background was none of those things. I decided at the age of eight that I was going to make the world better through words. And that's why I wanted to be a writer. And I did not ever deviate from that. I, I'm weird in that way. I knew it when I was eight years old, looking at a book. And so I never, I, I was doing an oral history in 2010 about love. Mm -hmm. It had nothing to do with this subject. And I interviewed someone, a distant family member who was a recluse our weird cousin, Bill. That's what, actually what they call him, weird cousin, Bill. Um, <laughs> he lived in the middle of nowhere in Iowa and he lived in his parents' basement until he was 59 years old. And he never had a girlfriend and he never had any friends. He never hung out with anybody outside of his family. He mowed the public square in his small town of Dyersville, Iowa for a job. This guy was sort of a Boo Radley kind of a guy. Right, right. You know, from To Kill a Mockingbird, he was a recluse there. Anyway, so when he was 59, my family in Minneapolis and I, we got the word that he had gotten married. And we were all just like, how did that, how did that happen? How right. did a guy like that get married? And to who? And to what? And how? And everything. So when I was doing this oral history about love, I got a chance to use my journalism uh, position as a, as a way to snoop and find out for the family what did happen. And how did he do this? And when I asked him, how did you become so unshy? So how did you get yourself out of isolation that profound? And I was expecting him to say psychiatry or therapy or drugs, you know, um, psychotherapy, you know, psycho. Right, right, right. Yep. And I just could not have been more shocked when he said, I joined the Toastmasters Club. That's what did it for me. They changed me. I mean, he didn't say this all in one quick thing, but he eventually, when I interviewed him more, he said it changed him from a person who only thought about himself, right? His speech anxiety and what other people were thinking of him to, well, what must it be like for them to listen to me? And that switch in perspective was the thing that unblanked him, if you know what I mean. Um, well, did he tell you why, you know, how did he stumble across Toastmasters? Because again, if somebody who's 59 and as you said, very reclusive, that impetus I, I'd be curious to say, how did Toastmasters drop into your head to say, that's where I want to go? Someone at his church at the local Dyersville, Iowa okay. church, suggested that he go there not to change his personality, but that he might meet some people there. Okay. Because his, oh, I know. His mother had died. His father had died. The family dog had died. And he was all by himself in this big, huge farmhouse. And, you know, I can imagine it was pretty oppressive. Right. And right. so this was suggested to him. And he just he did he wasn't even a great Toastmaster. He gave about half a dozen speeches of what was then their introductory manual of ten right. speeches. And each one of these speeches, these exercises teaches you a different component of speech. And that so when he said that, I guess for me, 
I'm a little bit anti-corporation and anti-establishment and anti. I love the idea that he just joined this nonprofit club. Right. And I think I'm not sure if I'm right, but it's like fifty-five dollars a semester, so it's basically free. And it was there were no experts involved or psychiatrists or people with credentials on the wall. It was just regular folks helping this guy, and it totally changed his life, 180 degrees. It's fascinating because I know a lot of people who have joined Toastmasters for not to be a professional speaker, right? They had no desire to say, I'm going to be a keynote speaker and I'm going to speak. But they talked, you know, would get together and learn how to tell stories. My grandmother, uh, who was a, a writer, uh, and she also went to Toastmasters. And what she did was she would write, her writing was writing stories for Toastmasters. And basically she told stories of, about us. We were five boys in our family, you know, and she would just write stories about us or how we, uh, you know, simple things, but she was very easy. You know, she learned how to communicate that through Toastmasters and she loved it, the camaraderie. But to your point, there wasn't anyone saying, I'm an expert, I'm going to teach you. There was a framework and other people supported you, common people who just wanted to learn how to get up and tell a story. Or as we said earlier, I want to feel that I'm at work, I'm comfortable, I can communicate uh, a, a thought in, in a, there's a structure and a way to do it. Um, so that's fascinating that it unlocked him and then he ended up getting married. That, that's a, that's a phenomenal story. It was, it was amazing. And then I started researching them and whenever I was procrastinating, you know, while I was supposed to be working on other things, I would go snoop about mm -hmm. public speaking and speech training. And, you know, I, I guess the way that I grew up, I thought that it was something horrible. It certainly wasn't for me. I was, right. you know, I was a punk rocker and a guy with a motorcycle when I was younger. I was always trying to be a cool guy. And so I was way too cool for anything like that. And also, I think that coolness made me think that I'm a confident guy. Mm -hmm. And so speech lessons to me seemed aimed at people who are uncool and they have no game. And it's to teach you to pretend like you're someone who's confident and right. to pretend like you have some game. And to kind of have that, you know, like a Tony Robbins kind of come on strong charisma and lots of energy and da 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 da. And I wasn't interested in any of that because it seemed super inauthentic to me and it wasn't how most people talk. And it's that very kind of P.T. Barnum, right. John Philip Sousa, rah, 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 America. Mm -hmm. ga, ga, ga. And like most people I know are over that. They're not, you know, the smartest people I know, the most thoughtful people, whether they're in tech or finance, they don't have that kind of personality typically. Right. And nor do they want to. And so for me to kind of realize there's a lot more going on here than that. It's not fake charisma lessons. It's this super deep kind of quasi-philosophical thing. And if you're lifting up the hood of what is a human being and how do we connect to each other and what is our identity and what are we all here on earth for, all of that stuff got you know, accessed by this one simple notion of how do you give a good speech? So. The stuff that they taught at Toastmasters all came from the ancient Greeks. And when I was kind of farting around doing my research, I found that and the history of that. And that was really what made me realize, oh my God, this used to be the biggest thing in education, teaching humans how to relate to and connect with other humans. And then it became uncool a couple hundred years ago and we stopped teaching it. So to me, that was like, we left this lost treasure behind Mm -hmm. and now nobody knows how to connect everybody well, and, and they don't teach it in, yeah they don't teach it in school I, I have um i have two boys one who is you know just finishing up sophomore year the other is just finishing up eighth grade and i asked them about that now they have clubs like in we're in new jersey deca business and you have to go and you present or they have debate club but to your point Certain people go, oh, that's not cool. But I asked my son, I said, do you have to get up and stand in a, well, I can't do that. That's what you do. And I said, well, this is a skill that I really think is missing uh, that school should be teaching people how to get up and communicate or present before they leave. That's doing them a disservice. I mean, if you look at the common core declaration of what's important and what an education should encompass, 40 times they mentioned the importance of speech 
and the way that speech attaches to civic discourse and how it's important mm -hmm. for democracy that everybody can stand up and have a civil conversation. And nowhere in this long document do they mention anything about actual classes or exercises or instruction right. about how to do that. They talk about everything else, English and literature and math and blah, 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 but they don't talk about how to do that. And then, you know, so it's very easy actually to teach speech. The, the Greeks had this great thing. I'm going to mangle the pronunciation, but it's called the Pro Gymnasmata. Okay. And it was this graduated uh, 14 step like cognitive slash speech exercises. And the first one or two were designed so that anybody, anybody could do it. And no one would be able to say, oh, I just can't do that stuff. Right. And so it is amazing to me that it's no longer taught at all in school because you could wrap it around a lot of other subjects and it wouldn't take up a lot of time. So, so to talk about that, the, when you said you found and you uncovered you know, ancient Greeks and they had this system, if you could frame that out or maybe give an example of a couple things that you found that said, well, here's a system very simple to use or explain. Oh. So it would start, I mean, I don't understand how they did school exactly back then, but it was, let's say around the, you know, what would be our middle school going all the way to late high school or early college. I mean, right. not exactly right. equivalent. But so the early examples would be to read a little tiny, it's not even a story, just a paragraph, a short paragraph and stand up in front of your class and you could stare at the piece of paper and read it. All you had to do was not, you know, spontaneously combust. And, and then after that, people could say, great, you just did your first public speaking. You are now a public speaker. You can never again say, I am too speech anxious to be a public speaker. You just did it, you won. And then the next one, it would go from there very quickly into little stories. There was a story that they used to use about a group of monkeys deciding, having an argument amongst themselves about whether to imitate humans and go live in cities or should they stay in the jungle? And so in reading that story, you would have to imitate the old wise monkey or the young right. impetuous monkey. And so then the teacher might say, so why did you use that voice for the old monkey? And why did you use that voice for the other monkey? So you start realizing with a bunch of stories like that, why do we start, you know, why do we use different voices for different characters? Why do we associate this kind of voice with Anderson and this kind of voice with the bad character? And, you know, why do we end the story with once upon, you know, once, what do we start with once upon a time and end with, and then they lived happily ever after. So you, right. you start realizing, oh, I'm using all of these musical and poetic things and just tricks every time I talk. And you could say tricks are bad, or you could say tricks are the thing that makes, that make other people know that we're not crazy. If you right. read all of the, the young voices and the old voices in a monotone, people would think that, you know, you're, you're out of it. You're disconnected. Right. You start realizing, oh, there's a lot of performing going on when we do things. And that performing is separate from the logic of what we say. If I said, two plus two equals four, I, all, what I'm saying is uncontroversial. Two plus two right. equals four. But if I say it in a weird voice, all you hear is the weirdness. Right. You Right. Exactly. Okay. And, so and it goes from there into bigger speeches. Give us, this is something I do a lot when I'm working with younger people. Mm -hmm. Give me a two minute speech about something that you love or something that you hate. Right. Well, people get really behind that because they're really attached to it. They're not going to overthink it. They're not going to get lost in the research. And it's funny. I worked with a group in New York uh, before the pandemic, a group of like sixth and seventh graders and then a group of eighth slash, slash ninth graders. And the younger ones all chose somebody or something that they loved and the older ones all chose something. <laughs> <laughs> huh? That's 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 interesting. See, and and what you just said, my my children went to a uh, 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 for a few years went to a Quaker school um, before they went to you know uh, to junior high and high school. And what was fascinating was they did a lot of that. You had to there was poetry night in front. All the parents came and in front of everybody. Everyone had to come up and write read a poem that you worked on and you wrote. Then another time it was same thing. You took a story that you learned and you had to, you could, like you said, just read it head down. You could imitate voices. You know, they expected a little more from the older kids to do that, perform, 
you know, move a certain way. But the mere fact that I always admired the fact was this was required by every student, wasn't optional, and it was celebrated by having the parents come in and applause happened and they appreciated and they celebrated the spoken word to exactly your point. Tell people, you know how to speak. You just stood in front of 50 people and you read something and it could be a quietest voice to big. That just takes time. But the mere fact that they did that was always something that struck me. And now that you're saying that, I go, oh, that, that makes complete sense why they did it to help children learn how to do it. It is a skill versus some innate gift that yeah. somebody has been, you know, dripped on their head uh, that only special people can do this. If I have one point to make for the rest of my life, it's that people tend to think I suck at this, I'm shy. My personality was formed such that I'm just not one of those people who can do this. And that's what I always thought, too. I was great in my everyday life. I'm funny. I'm weird. I can do accents. I can perform stuff and I can be articulate and put me on a stage and have me sing for my supper. And right. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And I just thought, well, that's my personality. I'm too authentic and it's not my fault. And too bad. You know, let those other people, those more showboaty people kind of do this. I don't want to be one of them anyway. And so many people, you know, I am far from unique. And no, I think- I, no, but to, to your point, my, my wife says the same thing. She, she looks at me and she says, you are, you're more comfortable on a stage talking to people. One of the worst things for you or more uncomfortable things for you is going into a group of people you don't know where you have to maneuver through. She goes, she's the reverse. So she'll say, I'm really good in the boardroom, but not on a stage. I just say it it's, it's one, it's practice. It's number two, it's there's certain skills to do it. But to your point is I never thought I was different. It's, I would get nervous or unsure is when I didn't know what I was talking about, right? If it was prepared and practiced and I had a reason, like you had said earlier, there's, there's a reason to do this, then there's no problem. Okay, we have to go do this, but improvise, no you know, maybe I'd learn how to do it. Um, But I think a lot of people, like you said, have this, this, they look at the excellence of someone, you know, the people who are at the top of their game and say, well, I can't be like that. Well, no one's asking you to be that, you know, just. And also there's a thing, and I definitely had this, I suffered from this. People feel like if it feels uh, anxious, if it feels uncomfortable, that means to do anything that makes you feel uncomfortable would be inauthentic. Right. And that is also a tripwire or a block, I think, to understand. No, if you learn how to do this, you won't feel uncomfortable. And it has nothing to do with being phony. You can learn how to do this and you'll actually be your real self more because to not say what you mean, to be so insecure and so awkward that you can't actually utter your thoughts to a group of people, it's hard to find something less authentic than that if you're not able to represent your contribution to a group it's not lying but it's also you're not telling the truth and so i think it's really important to get it into people's heads to not do this and not just you know be able to say what you mean and mean what you say that's a real handicap yeah i I, that that really struck me just when you said that is we we have a tendency to look at the wrong side of things. Meaning if I get up there and I have to, that's not really me. So that's inauthentic. But in reality, you have a viewpoint. You may have something that's really valuable to help people. And by you keeping it inside or not learning how to communicate that, that almost is, as you said, the, that's being inauthentic to who you really are. Uh, I still think, and what I, I'm, as I said, I'm excited to read the book is I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm excited for people to stop thinking that I have to be Tony Robbins, as you said, 
you know, go watch TED Talks. They sound normal, but even not that, just even sitting around the table with friends to be able to communicate an idea versus sitting there in silence or being able to stand at your workplace and communicate an idea or have an opinion about your report or talking to your team and being able to communicate what you expect from them in a confident way, a clear way, that's an effective way that gets the results you want. I think we do have a tendency to always tell ourselves what we can't do versus what we can do. And as I said, this simple way of building up your, it's a skill. It really is a skill. There's always going to be excellent people. Trust me, there's always going to be superstars. But if that's what you want to do, then you can go learn. But for most of us, we don't want to be that. But we also don't want to have people go, oh, God, could you please stop talking? The thing that blows me away is that the things you need to learn to get to be good at are mostly mental, mm -hmm. mostly easy, and they're so obvious that if there's anything difficult about them, it's, be, it's that they're so obvious. So I could tell anybody, I sort of distilled Aristotle into three basic insights. And Aristotle, you know, to go to the book, I read Aristotle's book about rhetoric called, you know, The Art of Rhetoric. 15 times and it was so hard because he packs more into one sentence mm -hmm. than most classes do in a whole semester. And you can breeze right by it and say, yep, got it, that's obvious, duh, and move on. And then you get snagged on it 25 times and you have to go back and reckon with it. So one of the things, for example, that he says is the public is the beginning and the end of public speaking or the audience. The audience is the beginning and the end of public. Okay, that sounds so obvious that you don't even need to think about it. Very, it's not controversial. But what he means is every single thing you do when you go up to, on a stage, the thing, whatever you're wearing, the background, the lights, you need to think it through in terms of the audience. The first words you say, the way that you describe yourself, the way you describe your subject, the way you connect your subject to them and present it as something that's relevant to them, interesting to them, necessary for them. Right. And, and basically your whole thinking about your presentation, if it's not helpful for the audience, if it's not framed in the way that they can absorb the most easily, then you're falling down on the job. Right. So that sentence, you know, if you break down public speaking into a group of different things, you could talk about body gesture and the words you choose and your vocal tone, you know, how you stand, you could talk about your costume, your dress, whatever. Um, all of those things kind of come into his one set, the, the audience is the beginning and the end of public speaking. You don't need to think about your vocal tone. You need to think about your vocal tone only in so far as it affects your audience and helps them. Right. You don't need to think about your, you know, standing around and being this really jazzy personality and crossing the stage three times and having a pink lapel and having all this stuff so that you stand out, except in so far as it will help their eyes and ears and mind understand you. And it's, it's super interesting. I mean, everything that we talk about now, when we talk about politics or when we talk about speech anxiety, mm -hmm. when we talk about fake news, when we talk about good politicians, bad politicians, when we talk about leadership, it is all in that book. And it's an impossible book for modern people to read because it's so dense and weird. He's not a teacher. He's a brilliant thinker, but not a teacher. So, so just, you said something right when you started talking about Aristotle and you were talking about obvious. So do you think one of the faults of people learning this or schools teaching this is because the assumption is it's obvious we already know it, so we're moving on to something else? I think it goes back to what we talked about earlier, how people think that speech anxiety or the inability to speak well to a group is based and rooted in a personality problem or an emotional deficit or emotional problem. And really it's this skill set that it's a little bit hard for us to see. Right. And so these rules are so obvious because they're so basic. They don't take a high IQ to understand them. If you explain them to me, I'd be like, yeah, okay, Glenn, yeah, got it. Yeah, and then I would proceed to write my speech or perform my speech as if I hadn't listened to a word that you said. 
So you need to kind of, if I'm working with clients or students or whatever, I need to reel them back and say, okay, what are my three principles? Let's go through these again. And, you know, by the third or fourth or fifth or 18th time, people have heard them, they get it, and they've written them down themselves and they can apply it again and again. But they're not about acting. They're not about how you feel. So these Greeks and then later the Romans who taught and developed a lot of the same stuff. They didn't talk about how little Johnny is feeling anxious today and we need to alleviate his fears. And he should imagine the audience naked or he should take a beta blocker <laughs> before his speech. They were talking about language and people. And so when so, you said, so so you were said, I, and i sorry to interrupt, but you said there were three principles and we talked about the one, the audience is beginning and end is the audience. What were the other two? Um, one of them is, is uh, how are you going to make your audience happy? So his basic thing, you, you see this in Dale Carnegie, you saw it in the guy who did, uh, who started Postmasters, Ralph C. Smedley. They had a way of saying it, which is that all speech is sales, which mm -hmm. I took issue with and I hated that because I thought it cheapened the human race and blah, blah, blah. But in the end, it turns out Aristotle said the same thing in different words. And what they mean is, okay, whatever I'm talking about, whether I am the devil or whether I'm trying to save the world or whether I have something really, really true and interesting or data heavy, mm -hmm. or it's a moral, you know, morally impassioned speech, whatever it is, I wanna change your mind about something. I'm, I'm looking to get you to believe me, to listen to me, to absorb my worldview. And you, for your part, aren't looking for that. What you're looking for is you wanna make Glenn happier today. Every person is basically like gravity for personalities and for brains, happiness is our gravity. The thing we're looking for in every speaker is how are you gonna make me happy? And that can take different forms. It could mean, please don't bore me. What's your right. point? Please be brief, please be clear. I have nine other Zoom calls today. <laughs> like just don't waste my time. And right. that's, what, so when you're focusing on my happiness, you are letting me know that you care about the one thing I care about most. It's not the subject of your talk, it's me, my happiness. Right. And so Aristotle had a very weird way of laying that out. And I read the book, of the 18 times I read his book, I think I read 15 times through without getting what he was talking about there. But he said, what I finally understood is if you're not appealing to people's happiness and their sense that you know, they're looking for that, no one's just gonna sit there and absorb your boring data. Right unless you recognize that. If you fail to recognize that, you're gonna look, you know, it's like looking at this instead of looking like this. You're, you're looking off to the side of who people are and they'll notice that and think that you're weird. Well, I've seen that where to, to your point is, the first is the audience and your second is making them happy. I've been in speeches or, or, or attended speeches where yes, that, that was a very dynamic speaker and they had gr some great information, but they didn't connect it to the audience. They didn't make it relevant to that audience. So they weren't happy because to your point is their happiness was, now I got to figure out what he's talking about or what she's talking about. How does that connect to what I'm doing versus using an example, especially if it's an industry, you know, you're speaking to an industry group understanding how well how can i get examples that connect to them so they go oh i got it now and that that ties into the happiness of i walk out feeling i understood i felt entertained i felt i got something i might have been moved to your point is i don't feel frustrated i don't feel disappointed i don't feel this is a waste of my time and sometimes speakers don't think that because it's also the, this is my canned speech that I, that works for me all the time. And I'm just going to go crank it up and do it. But every audience is, I like number one, the audience is the audience. It begins and ends. They're different, different time of day. Is this the first time, first speech of the day, the fourth speech of the day, you know, a, a lot of different variables. So I like that. It's, I mean, it's something that's, again, it's very easy to do. If I'm going to talk, let's say I'm promoting, I'm a, I'm a politician, I'm promoting a tax cut. I still, my, the details of it might be the same for every audience, right? The, the data part of it. But talking about why it will make you happy 
is going to vary from audience to audience. And if I fail to connect the dot the dots and talk about your income bracket or how it fits into your other local taxes, state taxes, whatever, like I've got to deliver that thing to your cognitive doorstep. Right. And it doesn't mean lying. It doesn't mean pandering. It just means if I'm talking about a cure for cancer in a certain part of China, I should find kids from that certain part of China who were dying of that form of cancer to really bring home the issue and how important it is, right. rather than talking about the Polish kids who I talked about the last time I gave the speech, speech back in Poland. Right, you know? right. Now, sometimes it's, it, to your point is there, there are some, if it's not done correctly, it does sound pandering because it sounds, because they haven't really connected all the pieces, it sounds just everything is the same except someone, some aide gave them the name or here's, here's what happened in this town, insert here, but they haven't thought through the flow or it just sounds off or it sounds a little hokey. Uh, and to your point is the delivery to the audience isn't really relevance to make them happy. It's see, I know you uh, to like me, but then that defeats point number one, which is the audience is the audience is the audience. Yeah, when it's done badly, it feels a little bit like robo call, right. you know, and phone tree things that say, you know, <laughs> thank if you, you want for sales, waiting push for one. us, thank you. Yes. John, your call is very important. Right, exactly. Or you get the emails of bracket, bracket, first name, bracket, bracket, you know, and then you see and they're going, oh, this, well, this is just a, a, a form mail. So, so let's, let's, let's switch gears for a second. You, you, you obviously are working with individuals. When you come in, if you were advising someone to self quote unquote self-diagnose, because again, maybe they don't have someone like you there, but when you go in and you're working with a group of kids or you're working with a business and they say, Hey, we need some help, or I need our CEO needs some help with speech. How do you approach? Like, what's your what's your 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 sort of system to be able to unpack where you have to work and where you have to tweak and fix? I mean, it's pretty similar most of the time. I have to say, it's the order might not be the same every time, but the the criteria, the things you have to hit on, seem to repeat themselves pretty often. I think that whole thing of connecting with people and focusing retraining your thoughts so that they're not focused you're not thinking too much about yourself you're thinking about them there's kind of a checklist right. at the beginning and i think it begins with this idea of purpose what do you want them to know or do as a result of this talk great and so if someone hasn't sat down to figure that out that's a red flag and it's a very easy thing to fix because most people do know it they just never sat down to articulate it right so, okay, that's what the purpose of your speech is. Do you tell them that anywhere in their speech? Do you say hi at the beginning of your speech? You'd be amazed at how many people give a speech and they just launch right into it. And so if your audience thinks that their happiness is the most important thing in the world, and coincidentally, they also think that they themselves are the most important thing in the world, much more so than your information. If you breeze into the room and don't say hi or some other kind of gesture acknowledging them hey right I'm here we're here we're here talking it's a nice afternoon thank you for having me here right from the beginning you leave them kind of gulping for for air because they don't get why you didn't acknowledge that most important thing and you know ceos do this all the time because they think they have this crazy idea that they're the most important right so just that one thing say hi know your purpose and then just for the hell of it explain what your purpose is Explain, I am going to talk about blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter if everyone knows what you're going to be talking about. They want to hear it. And then right. the next step is they want to hear how you're going to talk about it. Now, a lot of what I'm saying, these rules can all be broken and good speakers break them all the time. But these are just some basic notes that you want mm -hmm. to generally hit or consider as you're putting together a presentation. But most audiences want to hear, okay, I'm going to speak for 18 minutes. I'm going to speak in four different parts. The first part's about this, second part's about that, third part's about that, fourth part's about that. By the end of it, you will know, blah, blah, blah. And then as you're going through the speech, 
say, okay, so that's the first part that I told you I would tell you about, or now I'm going to tell you the second part, which is about blah, blah, blah. And I think, you know, as a writer, I balked at all of that. I thought this is redundant. This is inelegant. This is a waste of time. The people aren't right. stupid. They don't need you to repeat that so much and be babyish about it. And it's just, it's not really like that. I think people are very bad at listening. Yes. And help kind of shore up their brain and their attention span when you do that. Okay. Okay. So now we're uh, in part number two out of four. So now I know exactly where it is and how it all fits together. So you're just able to pay more attention to that person. Well, I also client. think that helps you as a speaker have, I always chunk it when I'm building a speech. I, like I said, I always try to get to the end. What's point? What, why am I doing this? And then what's the journey and then chunking it. And I, I always, again, I would say the most of the time, depending on you know, there might be a difference, but for the most part, I do exactly that. Here's what we're going to learn. Here's the learning and here's what we learned, right? So you're capping it to say, here's what's going to happen. Now it's happening. Here's what just happened. And it, and it connects all of this and allowing people to know there's four sections and we're on two because if not, you can lose the audience because they're looking at their watch thinking, how long is this going to be versus we're going to take the next 45 minutes. Okay, now I don't have to worry about time. I know it's 45 minutes. And okay, we only have 15 minutes left and we're going to, and they're going, okay. And you're guiding them along those journeys. Um, I think to your point, that allows the audience to go with you versus getting lost in where are we going on this ride i don't know yeah. and it's and as, as exciting as you are you're you're disconnecting because i'm going i i don't know where we're going i think also too you as a speaker you always have to contend with the fact that people have a hundred things going through their head they right. have a sick family member somebody is having sex with somebody they're not supposed to somebody's failing out of school somebody's on drugs there's a business thing or two or 10 that's going downhill that needs to be attended to. Oh yeah, you have to call so-and-so. So what, you know, somewhere between 10 and 80% of their brain is, you know, doing combat with all of these competing thoughts. Right. And so how can you make what you're talking about be clear? How can you make your slides be legible? How can you make your language not bog down with words that are hard to hear foreign words, complicated words that you never really unpack for them and explain, right. slang words. You know, if you get them hooked early on, not hooked, but if you get them to understand, I will not waste your time. I'm not gonna stand right. up here on stage and say, uh, yeah, well, you know, uh, I'm not really making eye contact. And, you know, a lot of the things I'm saying aren't really actually gonna land in your ears in any way that helps you. I mean, I see somebody like that and it tells me, okay, I don't really have to listen. I can think about all that stuff. In my head right. Versus someone who's very you. clear. Right. I, I think someone always is, has asked me, how long should something be? I said, as long as it needs to be, that's it. As long as it needs to be to get the point across in a very simple way that the audience goes, I got it. Okay. Move on or just be done. Well, what if we end early? Great. People will like you if you end earlier <laughs> than if you keep going longer just to hear yourself talk. Um, but it's it's what I really love about our conversation as we sort of wind down here is that it is a skill that one can learn. We do talk all the time and it's just understanding some tactics and skills that you could practice or think about. To your point, you start thinking Oh, I didn't write down the purpose of my talk. Let me write, let me go backwards first. I can't go forward till I go backwards to go, why am I doing this? Now I have a clear, that actually will allow you to generate a more effective presentation slash speech if I know why I'm doing it. And I think in the back of people's heads, right? When they're not understood, I might be saying more about me than people in general, but I always thought, well, people are just too dumb to understand this or the world isn't attenuated to someone so smart and thoughtful as me. Right. The world before swine, it's not worth it. So for me, this whole thing was a big comeuppance. I realized that I was arrogant and unskilled, you know, and a lot of other things I didn't really want to confront. But I do think, I hope, I know, I don't hope, I don't know, but I feel like that's very, very common. And I feel like the upshot of that, if no one understands you, if you're not good at making yourself understood, you're going to be pissed off. 
kind of lonely, kind of alienated. So mm -hmm. no, I I, I I think that's I think that's actually really a crux of it is that there there if I'm to be if I'm on stage, I I need to be that person. I need to speak in elevated words. I need right, and then everyone else is looking at that, going, well, there's no chance in hell that I can do that. So I'll just stay down here. And the reality is you're it's the connection and i think that's the word that connect like i just need to connect listen if i'm speaking to a, a group of english scholars yeah and we're all speaking but you're speaking in a language they understand they understand those words so you don't have to worry about a disconnect but that goes back to understanding your audience but i think that really truly is a phenomenal way to put it is i I don't need to be that way. I have to connect and more people want to connect on a basic level that I can understand. They'll come along for the ride if I understand you and I connect with you versus I'm intimidated by you or disconnected from you for whatever reason. And, you know, for me, I guess the, the real big and great takeaway is I don't need to dress like some fancy guy or talk mm -hmm. in some way that feels unnatural. This thing of connecting, there's nothing unholy about it or inauthentic, you know, it's really just think, oh, who am I gonna be talking to and how can I make this easy for them? There's nothing stinky about that. There's nothing. No, no, I think the more that we can focus on exactly that, how can we make it easy for people to understand what I'm talking about so that we can get the end result that we want. When I work with companies, that's what I work with them on is how are you communicating what you want? Because if you communicate it in one way, the picture in your head may not be the picture in their head. And then that's why you're frustrated later on about, well, we didn't get the results we wanted. Well, what words did you use? Were you really clear? Or did you show them? Did you explain it to them? Or did you use very general terms? Like we have to pick up our numbers and let's go out there and have a great day and let's go out and motivate each other. And we're going, well, what the hell does that mean? All right, I'll go try, I'll figure it out. And then you get that friction point of, I told you this. Well, you weren't really clear to me. You know, I didn't, I didn't connect with you. And that's, I think, a big struggle for a lot of people who are in leadership roles. They don't know how to communicate effectively. They think they are, but they haven't thought it through to really understand what, what it is, to, going back to the beginning, what's point B, what, what's the result I want and how am I communicating that so that someone can understand it and then take action? Yeah, a whole lot of it is practice and a whole lot of it is market testing. If, okay. you're, do, if you're getting ready for a speech and you find that you're anxious, guess what? You know, the way to solve that is several hours of practice and people can learn from me or from anybody else how to be a better speaker and then completely fail to do that practice because people hate it. And I understand it. I understand why. But if you want to be really good at this and not feel stupid after your speech, guess what? That's the downside. So my positive message is anyone can learn how to do this stuff. It's really not rocket science. But the bad news is, yes, you will have to do some work. Well, that I love that. That's a great way to uh, end. Um, so again, I can't wait to dive into your book. So before I let you out of here, every uh, person that uh, jumps on the podcast here, we ask a few random questions, uh, get to know you. They are don't have anything to do with anything except they're a bunch of list of questions I love asking people. And so don't overthink them. So just uh, answer them right away. Are you ready? Here we go. Um, what's one thing that you have to do or that you do every morning to get your day off on the right foot? Oh, I stretch and I meditate. Okay. Um, what's one thing that you can't live without? What's one thing you need? Humor. Oh, I love that. So then on my next question, what makes you laugh? Like really belly laugh? I have a nine-year-old son. He's usually good for a couple of those a day. <laughs> I like stupid physical comedy. I'm one of those really smart people, but my tastes are pretty simple. Oh, so I, 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 I'm with somebody you. A prat fall, great. I'm done. I'm I'm happy. Yeah, my father, my father, uh, we grew up on a lot of the, you know, the uh, Laurel and Hardy's and Abbott and Costello's and a lot of the, you know, that type of humor, Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin. So yeah, I'm with you there. Um, guilty pleasure food. 
anything chocolate. I mean, I have gotten disciplined enough to walk away from low grade chocolate, but if something is yummy and well made and high level chocolate, I'm I'm you're in. I'm All right. In. What's a movie or a show that you always stop when you run across it on TV and watch it? I never watch regular TV, so this question doesn't work but okay maltese falcon anything with old bogey okay Casablanca, yeah. maltese falcon no that I, makes sense that's what i'm saying a movie because there's certain movies whenever i run across or it's one that i always oh that's one i always want to see what was your favorite cartoon as a kid i can't remember okay we got into star trek pretty early on the early star trek and i know it's not a cartoon but that was the show that was sort of like the bible for us growing oh, up okay all right we got two more uh one your close circle of friends what's the one word that they would use to describe you <laughs> i dare not i dare not speculate um hapless no <laughs> um no, I would say devoted. I really do everything I do for the long term. So I think people now around me have realized, oh my God, that guy set the target. And if it takes him 20 years to get there, he will get there. I love that. That's a great one. So we end asking this question because we want to make sure that the people who are watching also from your perspective, we talked about a lot of things and there's so much great information. And for those of you listening and or watching, just you got to go back multiple times and, uh, but if if you had to say, here's the one thing I hope the listeners walk away with or apply or take take really to heart, what's the one thing out of our conversation you would hope they would grasp? Let me complicate that answer. It's more than one thing. Number one, it's that speaking and your ability to speak with other people is the most important skill that you have in terms of determining your success at work or in your personal relationships. And to make that very clear, if you're horrible at speaking to people or you put them off, no one's going to promote you and no one's going to want to be around you. So it's totally separate from your IQ or your work ethic. And it's just as important, if not more. Okay. So that's number one. It's the most important thing that you do. Number two, it's actually pretty easy to learn. It has nothing to do with whether you're depressed or anxious or whether you had a horrible childhood or you're shy. It's like cooking. It's composed of a bunch of technical thingies that you can learn and you don't even have to master them to be decent at it and totally okay. change your life as a result. Great. Love that. Love that. So first off, John, thank you so much for being here. This was a phenomenal, phenomenal conversation. I got a lot out of it. I'm excited for the people to hear this. As I said, get his book on Amazon. I have something to say. It is, it's, it is my read that I am taking with me when I go on vacation in the next week. I bring usually one book instead of 10. So this way I can actually accomplish something. So that's the one I'm bringing. So how can people either follow you on social or connect with you or read more or find more of what you, of your work? Um, how can they find you? I mean, I built a website and then rebuilt it several times and now it's getting good. It's just johnfbo.com. Okay. And yeah, I write thingies for different magazines, CNBC, places like that about public speaking. But eventually all of those will live on my website. So again, that's johnfbo.com. Okay. At this point, if you Google me, that site should come up. Yes, it does. I did okay. today just to double check. So yeah, that's where I did a lot of my research as well. So again, I appreciate it. So Again, thank you so much for all of you who are watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to leave your comments down below and please share this out. Again, a lot of great information here today. There's a lot of people that struggle with public speaking or are afraid of public speaking. And John's provided a lot of great content to help you. Uh, as always, I appreciate your attention. As I say at the end of every episode, you're in charge, but now John's given you a few more tools to help you become more successful in your personal life and your professional life, helping you learn to speak with more confidence and it is a skill. So go out and learn how to do it. Thanks again, appreciate it. Hope to see you in the next episode. Thanks again, John. Thank you, Glenn. Have a good rest of the afternoon. All right, take care. Okay.